Greetings and welcome back to Building the New World. It's my pleasure in this next session to introduce uh, Ellen Brown. Ellen is an attorney and the founder of the Public Banking Institute. The Institute assists municipalities to set up banks that serve as depositories for local funds that then service local community needs. Public banks can save state and local governments millions or even billions of dollars by cutting out middlemen and private shareholders eliminating fees and financing projects at lower interest rates. Ellen is the author of more than a dozen books and hundreds of articles. In her best-selling book, Web of Debt, she exposed the Federal Reserve as a private banking cartel that has usurped the people's power to create money. The book also explains how we the people can take back this power. In her latest book, The Public Bank Solution, Ellen explains how public banks work and how they are designed to operate in the public interest. Ellen also co-hosts a radio program called It's Our Money, and she is a fellow of the Democracy Collaborative. Ellen Brown, welcome to Building the New World. Thanks. Hello, <laughs> waiting for my PowerPoint to come up. Okay, I was gonna, I'm going to speak on how we can do a reset that actually serves the public interest. We clearly need a reset right now. Next. So we're living in crisis times, which is pretty frightening and alarming. But on the other hand, it's um, a great opportunity where, where we can um, make a difference in shaping our future. Things are clearly about to change, we want to make sure they change in the right direction. So I guess you all know, of course, we've got shuttered local businesses that may never reopen. Millions are unemployed. Revenues are way down. Costs are way up. We've got civil unrest brewing and a highly contested election. So things are looking nail biting um, coming up. And de debt is a serious problem in all sectors. So that's consumer debt, corporate debt, small business debt, and government debt at all levels. Next. <clears throat> so even before this uh, COVID crisis, we had a debt problem, as you can see from this chart, uh, all, sec all debt sectors were on the increase. Next. And the term Great Reset has been used before. Historically, it refers to currency resets, where you've got some sort of financial debt crisis or catastrophe, typically a war that's gotten the country into debt. So as you can see from this chart, actually our first reset was before this chart even started when uh, the colonists issued their own paper money, paper script. And then uh, we had the American Civil, or sorry, the American Revolution, where the uh, Continental Congress issued its own paper script again, the Continental, which uh, by the end of the war, it was absolutely worthless and it collapsed. But we managed to win a war against the world's largest power just by printing our own money. So that was pretty remarkable. Uh, and then we had Alexander Hamilton's first and second banks, which took the state's debts. The states were heavily in debt after that war and used them as bonds to, or turned, them, turned the debt into bonds, sold the bonds and used that to capitalize the first and second U.S. bank banks, which uh, then issued the first U.S. currency. And then, um, of course, the civil, oh, well, Andrew Jackson shut down the, the first and second U.S. banks, and then we had the Civil War, where uh, Lincoln did another currency reset. He was faced with huge debts, war debts, to um, British bankers, which he did not want to get caught in. So instead, he issued his own money, went back to the... Um, he, of course, he didn't actually do it. It was his Congress, but went back to the system of the American colonists 
and just issued what were called greenbacks or U.S. notes, American currency, and managed to win the war and avoid, avoided this huge debt and did a lot of reconstruction or construction, including building the um, Transcontinental Railroad, which was a major boost to all sorts of development and productivity. Um, but after he died, the, um, the greenback system was discontinued. Silver was demonetized, meaning it could no longer be the reserves for bankers' uh, currencies. And so there was a, a con radical contraction of the money supply and another huge depression. And um, there was an, a populist movement, an attempt to go back to the greenbacks, but that failed. And then we had... Um, in 1912 would be our, well, 1906, there was a major um, bank collapse, big big banks where there were runs on the big banks and uh, JP Morgan had to save them basically with gold from England, the Rothschilds. And uh, so the Federal Reserve was set up to be the national Federal Reserve system that supposedly would hold the gold and prevent bank runs of that sort. And also, of course, the Federal Reserve issued the, the first national currency that was, well, the U, first U.S., first and second U.S. banks issued their own currency, but, and so did uh, the greenbacks were, of course, currency too. But anyway, this was the, the first national currency of within about 50 years. And, um, it was supposed to stop bank runs that obviously didn't work because we had the biggest bank run ever in 1929. And then we had the biggest reset ever when, um, when, um, <clears throat> sorry, I'm forgetting my, uh, when Roosevelt took the dollar off the gold standard in 1933 and Congress passed the Glass-Steagall Act, which most people are, think of as separating depository banking from uh, investment banking. But the the most significant thing it really did was uh, FDIC insurance. In other words, we the people insured our own deposits in these private banks and that kept the private banking system going. And you can see from this chart, then we had, uh, well, we had World War II and uh, after that was the Bretton Woods system and that was, I mean, that was a global reset where uh, the dollar backed the global, the deal was that countries agreed that they would trade with each other, either they would clear their balances, either with gold or with US dollars. So the dollar and gold were interchangeable as reserves. And the reason the countries accepted that was that we had the most gold uh, or we did, but then in, uh, 1969, Nixon took the dollar off the gold standard globally because the, uh, de Gaulle in France had cashed out all their dollars for gold. And then the UK was threatening to do the same thing and that would have bankrupted us. So we closed the gold window. And after that, Kissinger and Nixon made a deal with the OPEC countries that they would sell their oil only in dollars. And then we had a petrodollar. And you can see from this chart that we're, I mean, it goes all the way up to 2050. But if you look where we are today, you can see that we've got another debt crisis and we need another reset. And some people, or I saw one writer quite cleverly, I thought, next, I guess I should put this up. Oh, no, that wasn't the slide I was thinking of. Anyway, uh, so there is a great reset that's being proposed by the World Economic Forum, but you usually think of resets as a currency reset, but this is a reset of everything. They're proposing a global system that will basically be a top-down technocratic system controlled by unelected technocrats, basically bankers and big wealthy, the 1%. Uh, the World Economic Forum is part of the Davos class. These are those 3,000 or so people that meet in Davos every year, representing all the big business leaders, the big political leaders. Um, it was founded by Klaus Schwab, who was a former member of the steering committee of the Secret of Bilderberg Group, which you've probably heard of. So this is 
not necessarily the system we want. And you can see from that graph, you can click on it yourself sometime, the world, uh, the great reset of the World Economic Forum. It's got all these, I mean, there are thousands of words written on this, on this website, but it's very hard to nail down exactly what they're talking about, but they're covering like 50 different areas that they want to redo everything like health and education and all those things we hold dear. Next. So this one writer, D.T.P. Wilkinson called the next financial reset, the pharma dollar. This would be because uh, everybody, the idea would be we'd all be mandated to get vaccines with the vaccine passport and ID 2020. I don't want to go into too heavily into what might be considered conspiracy theory, but it's definitely out there. I mean, it's not made up, uh, <clears throat> but I thought that was clever that instead of backing the dollar with oil, uh, pharmaceuticals are petroleum based. So it's still a form of oil backing. And it's the same people, of course, Rockefeller were the original, was the original oil banking, the oil banker, drug medical cartel is all one big cartel. Uh, and there's some other diabolical names have been given to this system. Martin Armstrong, who's an economist, calls it the elitist coalition to redesign the world. Uh, Matt Aaron called it a system of supranational technocratic controls under a banker's dictatorship. Great. And uh, Pepe Escobar calls it a technocratic digital dystopia, digital neo-feudalism, algorithm gobbling up politics. Next. So what he means by gobbling up politics is it leaves out democracy and individual human rights that our ability to have any influence on what's happening. This is all like these algorithms set up by te technocrats. I mean, algorithms can be good. Technology is definitely good, but it's one of these garbage in garbage out things. Like it depends on the programmer and the program. You want to put the right program in. So we want to make sure that it's a program that actually serves the people. We do need all these things and we need banks, but we need a banking system that's a public banking system designed as a public utility that serves rather than enslaves the people. Next. So how can we do that? Um, first, I wanna go into some history of our money and banking system, just to lay the groundwork here. We've had two competing money systems for thousands of years. Uh, this chart that you can see, or this diagram, is what most people are taught in economics class, and uh, it's, it's a private system. So most people think that money started by bartering, the people getting together and trading. In this picture, it's cows for chickens, but that wasn't too convenient because you might want to sell your chickens, but you might not need a cow. Uh, so gold or uh, gold bars and then gold coins and then metal coins in general became a medium of exchange, which was much more convenient because it, it had value in itself and you could sell your chickens for a certain amount of gold and then you could use that gold to buy whatever else you actually did need. And then that morphed into paper money and then plastic cards and then electronic money. And then in this chart, it's cryptocurrency, but I'm not going to go that far. I'm not going to go into that. Next. Uh, so that's what we learn. But in fact, money and banking go back farther than that. And they were it was actually originally a public government issued, government owned and managed system. Um, Michael Hudson is an economist who goes into this a lot. So it actually, uh, money and banking actually appeared 5,500 years ago in uh, Mesopotamia. So the ancient Sumerians had, had a system. It was the Sumerians and the Babylonians and you know that area lasted for 2,000 years. It was quite sustainable. Um, Next, the Sumerians uh, had some amazing knowledge from somewhere. 
they they were are considered the first civilization in many ways. By 3600 um, BCE, they had invented the wheel, writing, the sailboat, irrigation, and the concept of the city, although the city might be disputed. But anyway, somewhere they were very sophisticated in the idea that we, that we went from neo neo you know to neolithic man to this very sophisticated city and language and written language system is kind of hard to grasp next so their their written language was the cuneiform writings which are rather like egyptian hieroglyphics and they said in their own writings and they did not consider this you know religion this was history to them they said that the gods had brought all this and they had come from somewhere else, the gods who came down from somewhere. So it does sound like extraterrestrials. I'm definitely not gonna go into that too much, but I wanna go into their system. Um, so they said that uh, they originally, the workers were these lower gods and the lower gods rebelled. They didn't wanna do the work. It was the atmosphere was too heavy for them. And so, the higher Enlil and Enki were the two brother gods. Um, Enki genetically manipulated the highest life form he found here, which was us, and in order to make workers, that was the idea. So we were going to be workers for this <clears throat> for this uh, civilization, for these gods or extraterrestrials or whoever they were. Next. <clears throat> And uh, the written, the, so they, you could, the um, archaeologists have found these pieces of shale or whatever, like in that picture, that are basically accounts. They're records of trades, and they were, they were. It was an accounting system, keeping track of who owed what to whom, and it was all managed by the temple. It was a theocratic religious um, society. Next. And it was uh, the temple, which is a public government run, basically theocratic government run institution that made the loans. The temp, the temp, the people owed tithes to the, the people got the land, but the, the God supposedly owned everything. So the people got the land and got to work the land, but they had to give a percentage to the temple. And if they couldn't do it, like they had droughts or whatever, they could put it off to the next year, but they had quite high interest rates that they had to pay for this. And so eventually, of course, they would get overwhelmed with debt, just as happens today. Next. But uh, the king and the temple managed this whole system. They were the lenders. And so they could fix it. But I mean, they actually literally could push the reset button and say, all right, all debts, debts are wiped out, clean slate, uh, go back to your fields, which is where they wanted the people anyway. They didn't do many good to have people in debtor's prison. They wanted them out there work in the fields. Uh, and so they wiped the slate clean. And that's why it was such a sustainable system for so long, the longest civilization we've ever had, because they had a sustain, they were not killed by debt, which is what kills most uh, civilizations. Next. So the, it worked until uh, Greek and Roman times when money and credit were privatized. So there you see Jesus throwing the money changers out of the temple. Um, but so they could no longer do these debt jubilees because the king was not the lender. So you couldn't make these private money lenders wipe the slate is clean. They wanted their money. They wanted their gold back or whatever they had lent. Next. And of course, that's where we are today. So that's the system we've got today. And um, debt does overwhelm people. And that's the system we need to break out of somehow. So I, I want to address how we can do that next. Instead of jubilees, we have the business cycle where um, you have debt gets so, so high that it can't be paid. And then everything collapses, just like right now, for example, businesses are collapsing. 
and anybody and the rich the people who do have money then buy up the assets just as in 2008 2009 uh the wealthy bought up the mortgage or bought up the homes of the people who were foreclosed on and today you've got business little businesses going out of business and um, big corporations are moving into those sectors and getting good deals by merging with them or buying them out or just buying their property. Next. But uh, the American system did not start out with this usury system. It started out as a public money system like the Sumerian system. Uh, the American colonists did not have gold and so, um, and the colonists didn't like being taxed. So, so the governments figured out that they could issue this paper money, these paper receipts called scrip. And that was the local currency. And this worked very well, except that the Northern colonies particularly tended to overprint and inflated the system and that devalued the currency. Next. But in the middle colonies, and particularly Pennsylvania was the best example of this, they came up with another system. This was a public banking system. The Pennsylvania bank, or the Pennsylvania government established in uh, what was called the land bank, although so supposedly it was backed by land, but that they never actually did foreclose on the farmer's land. But they made loans to the farmers for 5%, which at that time was a very good interest rate. The Bank of England was 8%. And you couldn't get a loan from the Bank of England anyway. It's not like they had a branch on every corner. So this is your only option before that. Not, not much was happening in Pennsylvania. And they set up the system where, so the government, let's say, this is just my hypothetical, but let's say the government prints $105 lends $100 at 5% interest to the farmers, um, and it spends the other $5 out there. So you've got principal and interest out there, and you've got enough to pay back principal and interest. It all gets paid back, comes back to the government, and they start all over again, lend it at 5% interest, spend the 5%, et cetera. The result of that whole system was that they paid no taxes. They did This, this currency did not inflate or devalue and there was no government debt. Next. But meanwhile, there was a competitive system and these were the, um, this was, it started in England. <laughs> I mean, it was, it hadn't come yet in the 17th century to the US, but in fact, we didn't even have a US yet. But in Europe, the goldsmiths would take people's gold for safekeeping and uh, give them these Gold, gold notes or bank notes in return, and they quickly figured out that they could lend ten times, or they could print ten times as many notes as they actually had gold, and lend them out, and lend them at interest and make a nice profit. Because um, the people who left the gold with the goldsmiths for safekeeping only came for it ten percent of the time, and so that was the beginning of our ten percent reserve requirements. Um, Next. And in England, that system was institutionalized when the Bank of England, which at that time was owned by private investors, uh, was founded in 1694. Next. At a time when the king, William III, needed money to fund a war. So the bank issued banks, make notes, lend it to the government and only the interest had to be paid. That's actually the, the system we have today. We still are only paying the interest on our debt. <laughs> and uh, so in effect, the national currency was rented from private bankers. Next. The colonists issued paper script until the Bank of England leaned on King George to forbid it. The result was depression and the American Revolution. Next. So then we had what might be called the first U.S. reset or the first after we were actually a country. And that was Hamilton's first U.S. bank uh, where it was state. 
you combine the state debts and use that as sold them as bonds and use the bonds as capital for, to capitalize the bank. Next. And then, of course, Andrew Jackson shut down those two banks. So there was some corruption in the second U.S. bank. And then we went through a de depression or a big recession anyway. And then we had the Civil War. And uh, as I discussed before, Lincoln issued greenbacks and uh, uh, managed to win the war. Next. And uh, then we had a depression. I, I discussed that before, but that's a picture of what it looked like. Next. <clears throat> and then we had uh, a greenback movement, a populist movement. The bankers, or the, sorry, the farmers were losing their farms and the workers were out of work, a situation like we have today. So um, this group called Coxie's Army marched all the way from Ohio to Washington, D.C., the first ever march on Washington to try to get them to go back to issuing greenbacks. And that next, that was actually the inspiration for The Wizard of Oz. I wrote my <laughs> web of debt based on this theme, but I won't go into that next. So that, that failed, they were rejected at the Capitol steps. Um, so then the populace tried to expand the money supply in a different way by uh, re-monetizing silver. And the populist leader, William Jennings Bryan, who was considered the lion in The Wizard of Oz, uh, insisted that it had to be issued by the government, which, you know, it's, that would have been the American system and that would have been ideal from my point of view. But anyway, next. He said in his Cross of Gold speech in 1896, I actually heard a record of this, so I'll see if I can imitate him. <clears throat> we say in our platform that we believe that the right to coin money and issue money is a function of government. Those who are opposed to this proposition tell us that the issue of paper money is a function of the bank and that the government ought to go out of the banking business. I stand with Jefferson. <laughs> Sorry, this makes me cry for some reason. <laughs> I stand with Jefferson and tell them, as he did, that the issue of money is a function of the government and that the banks should go out of the governing business. <laughs> I think that's very clever. Next. Um, so, um, he was actually, he actually led the opposition to the Federal Reserve Act, which was, I think I got the numbers wrong. I think it was passed in 1912. But anyway, it was, it was modeled after the Bank of England instead of what, um, what the populace wanted, which was that the government itself would issue the money. In fact, it was um, <clears throat> the, the bank, sorry, the Federal Reserve was an independent central bank which issued the money and basically it was a banker's bank and it's what we've got today. And at that time, the 16th Amendment was also passed which uh, authorized an income tax specifically to pay the interest on the debt that the government would incur to this new central bank. Um, later that was, uh, Oh, oh, never mind. Sorry. Next. <laughs> oh, so I know what I was going to say. Sorry. They um, now the federal government does not. The sorry, the central bank, the Federal Reserve, um, returns its profits to the federal government. So we're not still actually paying interest to our on our own on that. But anyway. Sorry, I think I've, I messed that up to delete. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> Meanwhile, um, we, there was pu were public banks uh, sprouting elsewhere, public central banks of the, of the sort that uh, the, our populist movement wanted, William Jennings Bryan and the populist wanted in the U.S. but didn't get. This was, for example, in uh, Australia, the Commonwealth Bank of Australia, in New Zealand, and in Canada. 
but the Bank of England suppressed it again. And they devised the central banking system instead, which would be a global system, um, a system of central banks that would take over the power to issue national currencies, which would be lent to the government and the people. And the apex of the system would be the Bank of England. Next. But uh, after World War One, England did not have the money to back this this global system. So, and um, Professor Carol Quigley, who was actually Bill Clinton's mentor at Georgetown University, is a uh, historian and said he was the the banker's historian. Um, he wrote in Tragedy and Hope in 1966. The powers of financial capitalism had another far-reaching aim, nothing less than to create a world system of financial control and private hands able to dominate the political system of each country and the economy of the world as a whole. Next. The apex of the system was to be the bank for international settlements in Basel, Switzerland, a private bank owned and controlled by the world's central banks, which were themselves private corporations. So it was originally made up of four central banks. That was the UK, uh, the US, France, and Germany. Each central bank sought to dominate its government by its ability to control treasury loans. So that's what we've got now. Next. Um, so the Bank of Canada, which was borrowing from its own central bank, which was issuing the money, um, from 1939 to 1974, an excellent system, which we should have been doing, would have. Anyway, uh, so they funded all sorts of projects with national credit. And Roosevelt did something similar, but I'll get to that later. Next. Uh, in 1974, however, the Canadian government quit borrowing from its own bank and its debt shot up. So between 1961 and 2006, the Canadian government paid over twice its debt just in interest. Next. And why it did that was that it joined the Bank for International Settlements and the Basel Committee, which had been formed by the BAS the same year. And one of their key objectives was to maintain the stability of the currency, which was interpreted to mean that you can't let governments print their own money or borrow from their own central banks that would print the money because this would um, be inflationary. It would devalue the currency by over expanding the money supply. Um, so the governments were supposed to borrow from private banks on the presumption that private banks were just lending existing money, but we now know that's not true. Next. In fact, as the Bank of England confirmed in 2014 in their quarterly bulletin, um, banks actually create most of the money supply. Banks do not act simply as intermediaries lending out deposits that savers place with them. Commercial banks create money in the form of bank deposits by making new loans. Bank deposits make up 97% of the amount of money currently in circulation. Next. So how they do it is with double entry bookkeeping. They write up on one side of their books. Let's say you go to the bank for a $500,000 mortgage. They'll write that up on one side of the books as an asset to themselves because you're going to pay that back over time plus interest. And they'll write it on the other side of the books as a liability to themselves because they're going to create a deposit account and put that money in it. And you can write checks on that account. And so when you do, they're going to have to come up with reserves somehow to, um, to and the reserves then will go from the Federal Reserve or whatever their reserve account is over to the, the bank of, in this case, it would be your seller. Uh, and, but from the point of view of the bank, they say, well, we, we've got $500,000 plus, $500,000 minus, it all comes up to zero. And that's how they make their books balance. And that's where our money comes from, most of our money, 97%, according to the Bank of England. Next. Um, now, it may look, because they have to come up with the reserves, it may look like they're just lending their deposits. The reserves come out of, typically would come out of deposits. 
or they'd borrow it from somewhere. But if you consider if you have two banks doing the same thing, Bank A creates a $500,000 loan, which becomes a check, which goes into Bank B. Meanwhile, Bank B creates a $500,000 loan, which becomes a check, which goes into Bank A. So they both have a million dollars coming in as deposits. Uh, I mean, sorry, $500,000 coming in, $500,000 going out, their books balance, and yet a um, million dollars now exists that didn't exist before. They're both those two depositors now each have $500,000 that they can spend into the market. And that's where our money supply comes from. So we actually need debt in our current system to have a money supply. And when people quit borrowing, the money supply shrinks. And that's why the Fed's always trying to pump up borrowing. They want to keep the money supply in existence the air is going out and as people are paying off their debt, so you've got to keep getting more debt in order to have a money supply. Next. Um, you can see that, 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 where, that that's where most of our money comes from, from this chart of the money supply. M2 is a circulating money supply. And the purple at the bottom is the currency, which is all that the government actually prints paper and coins. So what's all that red that comes from somewhere else it comes from? <clears throat> um, this bank created money. Next. So what's wrong with the system? There's several things, but first is that private bankers in, are in control. They can choose to lend or not. They can set their terms. They can lend on favorable terms to their cronies and much more owners terms to us, et cetera. Uh, this is a quote from Robert Hemphill, credit manager of the Federal Reserve Bank of Atlanta, 1934. He said, we are completely dependent on the commercial banks. Someone has to borrow every dollar we have in circulation, cash or credit. If the banks create ample synthetic money, we are prosperous. If not, we starve. Next, that's clearly a, something that should be in the hands of the public. Uh, then there's the problem of that banks create the principal, but they don't create the interest. So where's the interest going to come from? It, If you look at the whole, I know there's an argument about the circulation of money, et cetera, velocity of money. But if you look at the whole system, there's the interest has to be borrowed from somewhere in order to create more money to pay it. Next. Um, so debt, it, we, you know, you can look at charts and debt at interest always grows faster than the real economy. Next. So it's basically a pyramid scheme. You have to keep feeding it with debt at the bottom to support the creditors at the top or the interest that their, their profits they're expecting. Next. And as we know, indefinite growth is unsustainable. The whole thing will eventually collapse next, leaning, leading to booms and busts or what's called the business cycle. Next. So we could do what the Mesopotamians did and do debt jubilees, but like with the Romans and the Greeks, the debts are no longer created by the government. They're issued by private bankers and other private parties who are not willing to write off their debts. Next. But there is another alternative. There, the, the question is, how do we fill this gap between debt and the money available to repay it? That the debt is always bigger than the money available to repay it. And Ben Bernanke said, um, it's easy to cure a debt deflation. That's what it's called. And he was actually citing Milton Friedman. But he said, all you have to do is fly over the people and drop money on them. So that that's sort of the source of quantitative easing, but they've never really done it. They don't fly over the people. They fly over Wall Street and drop the money on big moneyed interests. They're not dropping it on us, but they need to drop it on us. Next. Uh, if they did that, the critics say that um, they point to the quantity theory of money, which says that if you increase the money and you don't increase the supply, you'll drive prices up. Next. 
and cause a hyperinflation. But in fact, the only the real the hyperinflations we've had, like in Germany, Michael Hudson writes about this in uh, the German hyperinflation or the uh, you know the Weimar hyperinflation or Zimbabwe or Venezuela. Those are examples that you always get. Those are all happened because the countries owed a debt in a foreign currency over which they had no control, typically a war debt, but anyway, a big debt. And um, as long as your debt is in your own currency, that won't happen. Or if you generate money and spend it into your local economy for productive things, it won't happen. And we can see that by looking at China. How do you explain this? Their M2, which is their circulating money supply, um, grew by 1,800%. That's the top line there. I mean, that was, that's an amazing amount of growth. 18 times in 23 years, going back to, I can't even see that, but 1996, I guess. <clears throat> and, uh, and the bottom chart is inflation. It stayed stable. It did, in fact, they had more inflation before they had this big boom than afterwards. Now, why is that? Next chiefly because their productivity went up at the same rate. So supply and demand did go up together. So if you use the money to produce things, if it drops into the real economy instead of the stock market, does it really, well, we go into that. But anyway, if, if you put it into true productivity, then uh, you can maintain the stability of the currency. Next. Um, so prices go up only when demand exceeds supply. Next. And we have another example from the U.S. When, when uh, the Lincoln's government printed the greenbacks, they actually issued $450 million in greenbacks, which doubled the money supply. So that would be like if we put, actually, I think my figures are old here. <laughs> But 15, which I think the money supply is a little higher than that now, but it'd be roughly adding $15 trillion today to the money supply. And everybody would totally freak out and say that would be inflationary. But it wasn't. Um, the, the, and it was very productive. They actually created the Transcontinental Railroad, lent it to railroad companies that built the railroad and turned a profit, a 60% profit by 1869. Next. And here's a chart of inflation. And you could see that all through that period of the 1800s, inflation was quite steady. I mean, there were some blips, but it wasn't right around the, um, wasn't right around the Civil War. That, I mean, there was some inflation in the Civil War, but there's always inflation in wartime because there are shortages in wartime. And it was not, and also, of course, any paper currency is going to be devalued relative to gold because people would rather have gold in a, in a crisis than a paper currency that they're not sure is going to last. But, but it wasn't because of overprinting of the money supply. And you can see that where the money supply or where inflation really took off was in the 1980s and 1990s when um, the, the rule regulations were liberalized, allowing derivatives and all kinds of mortgage-backed securities and all these things. We didn't have these speculative type investments. And that's what drove up inflation. Next. Uh, another factor in the Chinese uh, stability of the currency is that they're big savers. So when they got more money, uh, like they were producing more stuff, and so they were getting paid more, they saved more. They didn't. Their consumption didn't go up. Uh, the chart on the left is consumer spending as a share of GDP. You can see it actually went down, and gross national savings as a share of GDP went up. Okay, next. Um, now, we are not big savers. <laughs> in fact, or, I mean, or certainly you can see on this chart that the bottom 90%, as far as this chart went up to, which is not all the way up to today. But anyway, after the Great Recession, um, 
the bottom 90% in terms of uh, money and savings of the population save virtually nothing. So next. And we also have very high household debt, as you can see here. Next. Uh, hmm, I'm not sure that slide belongs there. Anyway, but because if when you have, could you go back to the last slide? Sorry. Maybe I put that up. Okay. If you, if the money, let's say you fly with helicopters over the populace and you drop money on them or something like a national dividend or universal basic income and and the people have a lot of debt, if they pay down their debts with the money, they could even it could even be a requirement that they pay down the debts, let's say, then that is going to shrink the money supply because money is created when debt is created. It's created as a loan. And when the loan is paid off, the money supply shrinks. That money is extinguished. And of course, also, of course, money that's saved is not going to drive up um, prices. And in a time like right now, when people are desperate for money, they are not going to be running out and shopping for frivolous things. They're going to be saving. Hopefully, they'll be paying down their credit card debt for starters so they don't have to be paying 20% interest. And then uh, save the rest if they don't desperately need it right now. Uh, and so none of that will be driving up consumer prices. So we should be able to have a stable money supply. In fact, I've seen figures about about a thousand dollars a month is the actual gap between the amount of um, the amount that people earn and uh, the cost of living. So that's how much it would actually take to um, to fill that gap between money or between debt and the money available to repay it. Next. Um, so, so we could actually drop quite a bit of money onto the real economy and onto real people who are struggling, particularly now. What we would be doing is just replacing that money that they used to have that they're no longer earning. So you could use that for infrastructure, for saving the environment, for universal basic income. I know that's controversial because uh, it's considered a possible tool of uh, the the World Economic Forum, the Davos, the uh, New World Order group in order to persuade people to accept this digital currency that would be <laughs> where we'll need like a vaccine passport to get on a plane and it will control our, our bank accounts and all that. But it's got potential. The thing is people need money right now. And if we could get control of the system for the public, it could be a good thing. In fact, if with some of these technocratic things they're talking about setting up, if we could get the public to control that in a proper way, then those are good tools that we could use for all those things we need. We, we could afford Medicare for all, we could afford student debt relief. Next. Um, and here's an idea I like a lot. There's a bill on right now, the National Infrastructure Bank bill. There are several National Infrastructure Bank bills, but this is the one I like the best, HR 6422, which is modeled on Roosevelt's Reconstruction Finance Corporation, where uh, um, he ca it capitalized the bank with, it wasn't even a real bank. It was just a lending company, but it turned out to be the biggest financial institution in the country, in the world in the 1930s and 1940s. So they started out with a rather modest $500 million capitalization. They issued bonds that were mostly bought by the treasury. And then they loaned or invested over the next um, 32 to 57, 24, <laughs> Sorry, 52, 25 years, uh, $40 billion with which uh, the, the country was rebuilt. All sorts of infrastructure was built. They made loans only for what were called self-funding loans. These were things that paid back like um, power dams or 
um, bridges that, um, you know, toll bridges or something, something that actually infrastructure that actually generated fees or funds. And then that money went to pay back the loan. So the books remained, were, re remained in balance. And in the end, they, it actually, the, the, Reconstruction Finance Corporation actually turned a profit for the government, which is amazing. They rebuilt the whole country with credit and uh, that was paid back and they turned a profit on it and got all this infrastructure out of it. And those beautiful buildings you see with all that wonderful painting. I mean, people had the time to put art into their buildings. We could do that again and we should. Uh, and then then we got World War II and the, the Reconstruction Finance Corporation was a major funder of that as well. And of course, that was a highly productive period. Next. Uh, and that's how the Chinese do it. They own their own, the government, the federal government, well, and the local governments own their own banks. And so they could just issue the money as all banks do as deposits and then uh, build the thing like they built 12,000 miles of high speed road rail in a decade, which is amazing. And, and then the profits from the rail pay, pay back the loan. And in China, because they own, they own like virtually everything. Well, anyway, they own major businesses. If, if the bank goes bankrupt or if the books don't balance or if the company, the, the borrower goes bankrupt, they don't put them into bankruptcy. They just, uh, they write off the debt, which is a debt jubilee, which is what uh, they can do that because the, the banks are, are the lender is the public, it's the government. Next. So if we can't get the federal government to act on these proposals, we can still do it. We can do it by creating our own local public banks, state, state, county, city, et cetera. Next. Uh, globally, 25% of banks are publicly owned. Next. I think I'm going to have to really hurry on this. Um, in in the U.S., we have only one state-owned bank, the Bank of North Dakota. Um, I started writing about it in uh, 2008 because I knew that North Dakota was the only state that had its own bank, so I was watching it, and it turned out in, by the spring of 2009, it was the only state that escaped the credit crisis. They had um, their books were bad, and they weren't in debt. Um, they had the lowest unemployment rate in the country, the lowest default rate, and the lowest foreclosure rate, and the most banks per capita. Next. And according to the Wall Street Journal in 2014, the Bank of North Dakota is actually more profitable than Goldman Sachs and J.P. Morgan Chase, and that they're, yet they're not even trying to make a profit. Their mandate is to serve the public interest. Next. Why, so why are they so profitable? I mean, the rumor was it was because of oil, but they had a big oil bust in the last decade. And still the Bank of North Dakota is just reporting record profits year after year after year. So it's definitely not oil. <clears throat> so we argue that it's because of their business model. They don't have private shareholders bleeding out the profits. They don't pay bonuses, fees or commissions, no high paid CEOs, no advertising. They don't need to advertise. They by law, all of the state's revenues are deposited in the bank. They don't have to advertise for borrowers either. They partner with the local bank, which then is basically the front office dealing with the client. And then the Bank of North Dakota steps in, acts sort of like a banker's bank, uh, helping with the liquidity and uh, capitalization, and basically helping with the money issues. <laughs> And then the, their, their profits and their savings, they pass on to the, to the borrowers and the communities. Next. And in March of this year, the Federal Reserve came out with some new rules that make it even easier to set up a public bank if you are a state or local government, particularly a state government. That banks can now borrow from the Fed's discount window at 0.25%. It used to be 
that nobody would go to the discount window because it was at a penalty rate. And if you went there, it meant that if you, the bank, if, if a bank went there, it meant that uh, nobody else wanted to lend to you. So it meant you were in trouble. So they didn't want it. It was a stigma attached, so they didn't go there. But now the Fed has said, come one, come all. Any bank in good standing, we encourage you to come. Um, not only have they dropped the the interest rate to almost zero, 0.25%. 0 That's very low. You're not going to get that anywhere else. But they eliminated the reserve requirement. And so what that means, uh, this, uh, this is a quote out of a Forbes article, until further notice, banks need not hold any reserve against their assets. This means that banks could theoretically continue making loans to infinity. Now that sounds a little creepy with the uh, you know big Wall Street banks, but look what it means for a public bank. That a public bank can it means you don't have to worry about liquidity. You can just if you can just go to the federal the to the Fed's discount window and borrow at zero to two point five percent. You don't have to rack up a whole lot of deposits. One problem we have setting up public banks is that um, the states don't want to commit to put their revenues in a public bank. But you don't even need that because you don't need, you, there's no longer reserve requirement. You don't have to have these big reserves. You can just go to the Fed and borrow what you need. Uh, that what does moderate or what the safety valve is now the capital requirements. So you still have to make prudent loans. In other words, you have to make loans that are going to get paid back in order to meet the capital requirement. I think I've hit my time limit, so I won't go try to go into what that all means. But the thing is, there is still a safety, safety valve there. Uh, you know, the Wall Street banks are questionable. But the point is that we could set up our own public banks that issue money directly into the economy, expand the money supply, get things moving, act as a stimulus for the local economy. And we can, uh, if we could get the feds to act, we could get some helicopter money that would, obviously what we need is money to start, solve all of our economic problems, money solves the problem. And it's been done historically where the government just issues the money. But the problem is that our government tends to either think this would be inflationary, but it actually wouldn't, depending on where you put the money. You've just got to make sure that the loans are in the right place. And if you're dropping money out of helicopters, you've got to make sure that helicopters are flying the right place. <clears throat> So next, I guess I'll wait for <laughs> questions for anything more. But uh, for more information, the publicbankinginstitute.org is our website. We've got lots of information there. And I've got over 300 articles on my blog at ellenbrown.com. And these are my books on the subject. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you, Ellen. Uh, we really appreciate it. Actually, you know, a lot of the, we were monitoring questions as they were coming in and you were actually answering the questions <laughs> as they were coming in. So, um, so it's, um, it, it's a really rich presentation. Um, so just, you know, thank you so much for this. Um, so uh, maybe a couple of questions that I have for you uh, and we, we, and you could just give us more color with all of this. Um, what, in terms of, and I think it was one of the questions that came through in, in the, in the, uh, in the chat was why aren't, why aren't there more state banks like North Dakota's like what's not happening or is there something that actually prevents that from happening more widely? Mm -hmm. Well, we've certainly worked on it and we've got, we know what the pushback is going to be by now. And one thing they'll say is, uh, we have plenty of banks, you know, of course that the Wall Street banks are pushing back. I mean, we, and the Wall Street banks and the local banks, it's the local banks that would actually profit from all this, but they're aligned with the big banks because um, at the, when things are bad, they may have to sell out to a big bank for one thing. And um, so anyway, they're, I think they're hesitant to go against the big banks. So we have to persuade them that this is a good idea. And one problem is that the 
governments do not really want to put to commit. The treasurers object to kind of losing control of their deposits by putting them all into a state bank on the Bank of North Dakota model. But we wouldn't have to do that. Now that the Fed has eliminated the reserve requirement, that means the bank can just issue loans. And uh, and as long as they're good loans that to get paid back, then and they can get the liquidity from the Fed. So there really is no downside risk that it Oh, well, then another problem is, of course, capitalization. So let's say you, you need a, you have a 10% capital requirement. So let's say you want a $10 million bank. You're going to have to put a, find a billion dollars somewhere for capital. And in this these trying times, that's very difficult for states. They don't have an extra billion, <laughs> billion to, to uh, you know, experiment with. But we definitely, we've got a lot of momentum. We've got... Um, over 25 bills pending, I think, in different states. And we've got over 50 groups that are working on their local legislators. So I think it's a matter of time. And so and when I was complaining about how long it's taking, um, somebody reminded me that it took something like 30 years for women to get the vote. <laughs> I mean, you know, for the suffragettes to succeed. So, which sounds like an easier, <laughs> an easier thing to pull up. Yeah, and, and well, and here's a question that came in um, from the chat. Uh, so, is the Chinese monetary system different than ours? If so, is that the main reason why this is becoming the Chinese century? Yes, I would say it's their monetary system. They can issue their own money, and they own the banks. So. So they can issue as needed to build whatever they want. And we can be doing that. We did that in the 1930s and we should do it again. And we could have a national infrastructure bank that would basically, um, the proposal on the one I was suggesting would um, you uh, do like Roosevelt's bank or do, sorry, do like uh, um, Hamilton's bank and actually use bonds for capital, that they would buy the bonds from the bondholders in exchange for uh, preferred stock, which would be non-voting, so that it would still be a public, publicly controlled bank, but they would get some dividend, and the dividend would come from, they would get the interest on their bonds, plus a dividend on top of that. So that makes it, would make it very attractive to the sellers of the barn. So it seems to me that that's kind of a no brainer. They've got a lot of support in, among different legislators, so. Yeah, well, that's good. It was, it was a good a trend potentially there. Uh, the next question, are there any county banks? Um, there are, County groups working on it. There's not. I mean, you could have any. You could have a tribe, even any sort of public group. I'd love to see some sort of a community currency that would actually work. I mean, there have been proposals for like digital currencies or just a sort of a debit card that you could have. A, if the problem is getting the merchants to accept community currencies, but if you could get the whole community together and they all would agree to accept this currency so that merchants would know they could spend this money on something. That would say, in South Korea, they're talking about a, a universal basic income that would be a digital community currency just issued into the, and I think that was a county, county arrangement or province arrangement, I guess. Sure, okay. And then uh, another question, could an intentional community have a public bank if organized as a tax exempt entity? Um, well, that's what I'm saying. I think you could do a community currency. You could definitely, sure, you could set up a bank. Um, you, you're going to have to get capital. You know, you still have to get a charter from your state in order to play with the feds, in order to be in that system where you can get cheap money in where you can clear checks from other banks, you know, take money in and send money out. You, to be in that system, you got to get a charter, which means you're going to have to come up with capitalization and show them you've got some real bankers on your, you know, you have to comply with all the requirements, but sure, any firm or community could do it if they had the capital to get started. 
Yeah. And then there's another question, but let me just, uh, cause I'm curious about this. Like what's like with the North Dakota bank, it's, it's, it's a state chartered bank. Is that, yeah. okay. And then is, what's the difference between then the state charter and like a national association type bank? Um, well, the state charters charter are chartered by the state. You know, you've got to, in California, we've got the, um, uh, the D Department of Business Oversight, you know, where we, they, they approve the banks. So they, they have different rules. They have local rules. So the national banking system was set up in the 1860s, and the idea was to get everybody into the national banking system, but they didn't all want to join. And um, um, that's a long history. Yeah. Well, but it, does it, but the, does it affect the insurance at all or, it, or FDIC insurance is like for any? If you want to be in the federal system, in other words, if you want to be able to borrow from the Fed, which I think is right now is the biggest advantage of having your own bank, you're going to have to have FDIC insurance. But it doesn't, I mean, it, it makes no sense if your big depositor is the government because the government's gonna have way more than $250,000 and that's all that it covers. But on the other hand, because you only have to cover $250,000, it's not gonna be real expensive. So it's not a huge deal. Yeah. Okay, thanks. And then the next question from online is, in a world of periodic debt jubilees, what happens to the value of private savings when a jubilee is declared and all debt is forgiven? In a public bank, what criteria is used to determine a quote unquote good loan and who administers it? Sorry, I, I didn't quite catch can you, that. Can you pop that question back up? Okay, I'll read it again. Yeah. If you can see it there. Uh, well, I, you wouldn't be forgiving debt. Uh, what you would be doing is giving people the money to pay off their debts. So in today's situation, you're basically giving people the money that they used to make in order to pay their mortgage or to pay their rent or whatever. So you're going to have the same amount of money in the system as you had before. We obviously have a shortage of money in the system right now or shortage of money that's being paid out to, yeah, okay. to run small businesses and run local economies as opposed to the stock market, which seems to have yeah. Pull it come out quite well. Uh, you know, and, and so this reminds me going back to like 2008, right? When we had the, the credit bubble, uh, 2008, 2009. And there, there was, you know, a lot of criticism that like, well, the banks are getting bailed out, but the people aren't. And so do you see parallels with like what's happening now um, with that? Yeah. Is there a better way, I mean, to, to, or is there another way, a different way? How does public banking potentially uh, remedy this? Um, the, the actual, we did have a financial crisis before we had a virus situation. So last um, September, repo rates went up to 10%. So the banks were borrowing, the, the Fed wants the banks to borrow from each other. And that's what the, um, that's the interest rate that the Fed sets. But the banks weren't borrowing from each other because they didn't trust each other after 2008. And so they would go to, and also because the Fed's, well, long story, but anyway, they quit borrowing from each other and they went to the repo market, which is um, a private market where it's backed by collateral. So if you want to borrow, you post something like a bond and then, um, supposedly it's like a pawn shop and the pawn shop gets the or they give it back to you you get it in the all day long and the, or you get it at night when you have to meet your reserve requirements See, now we don't even have a reserve requirement and um and then the, the lender would get it during the day you're sort of playing ping and back and forth with this anyway that that system collapsed um in September 2000, 2019, so last year. And, uh, and so the Fed stepped in and was doing, I think it was a trillion, that sounds too high, trillion dollars of 
there anyway this fed was coming up with a lot of credit for to to backstop this repo market so meanwhile it's a private market they're also backstopping hedge funds and other parties that are not really the fed's <laughs> problem so they fixed it by opening their discount window and saying, forget the repo market. We've got a better deal for you. It's safer. Can't do better than coming right to the Federal Reserve. They're not going to go bankrupt. So, and now they're talking about um, letting uh, some sort of digital currency, which I know goes along with a lot of conspiracy theories. A lot of people are nervous about this. I'm nervous about it too. But anyway, it would be functional if if we could get control of this system, if this, if it was a public central bank issuing, allowing us to bank right at the central bank, that would solve a lot of problems. First of all, they could pay interest that would just be created on the books. They are, they ha were paying the banks a very hefty interest of like 2% and our bank accounts weren't paying that. So we should be able to bank with our own central bank and it would be an easy way to distribute things like uh, national dividend or any kind of payments that they want to get to people to the unbanked and the underbanked. They could all just open accounts with the Federal Reserve. And so that would solve a lot of problems. And in fact, it would eliminate the need for the repo market because that was sort of created for the big investors that had way more than $250,000 to put somewhere and they didn't want to put it in a bank um, and they wanted to get a little interest on it and they wanted some security for it. But if they could put, if they could open an account with the Fed, then we could get rid of the repo market, which is a, kind of a dodgy thing. It would solve a lot of problems. Anyway, you could, yeah. the, the whole system would be much more efficient if it was all public, but we need, and I'm sure it would be controlled by algorithms, but we need an algorithm that is programmed by, you know, somebody whose heart's in the right place, you know, that's actually trying to serve the people and not trying to serve big, big money and big business. Right. Yeah. Because algorithms are, have bias, bias yeah. whoever's programming them. Yeah. Yeah. Well, spe so speaking of conspiracy theories, she's kind of skating on the edge with this next question of that. Is there any truth to the theory that JFK was killed because he wanted to shut down the Fed and go back to uh, U.S. Bank? Well, I'd love to think that because I certainly loved JFK when I was young. Um, but what she did was to sign an executive order to issue some more of these greenback was it they were, I think there were two dollar bills or I'm not sure which kind of I have a greenback two dollar bill but any or maybe it was five dollar bills but anyway they were issuing greenbacks but that was already in the you know it was already in the law that they would be renewing these greenbacks periodically or these US notes so it really wasn't all that radical but it could have been an indication that he was thinking along those lines. He certainly was not a friend of the Fed, but then he had so many, he had taken on so many big opponents that it's hard to say which one. Yeah, yeah <laughs> that's one. Whole, right. That's a whole other program, I'm sure. Right? Yeah. Um, uh, next, the other question here coming up is there is, is there is there any truth to the theory that the U.S. invaded the Middle East when OPEC went off the U.S. dollar? Um, I would certainly think that Libya was attacked because of the money system, but it, you know, they, they started their own set. Well, in fact, I think there is truth to it. Yes. Because, uh, the, what was it? Seven countries we were supposed supposedly targeting. They all had their own central banks and were issuing their own money. So they were not on the, on the, um, bank for international settlement central banking system. But Libya was the bi biggest. They, they had a lot of gold. They had used uh, primary water and with this big dam system that was irrigating the whole country, turned it green. And they were trying to get all of Africa to join this gold just gold backed currency system where Africans would be issuing their own money and they were going to show them how they could also use, you know, do this 
dam system that would uh, turn their lands green as well. So there was all that, you know, there were, and we had to stop all that because <laughs> anyway. I'm and, and I guess that, and maybe it dovetails, are there any banking reasons why the U.S. bullies Iran? Uh, well, they're another one that issued, you know, they're not in the regular system. But what I've heard is that there, there was, a, you know, Iran, Iraq, that was where the Sumerians were. There's also, depends on how conspiratorial you want to get. I mean, I love this stuff myself, and I'm not sure I want to talk about it. You know, this whole thing about their, the, there are portals there that are important. I don't, I guess I don't even want to get into it. But yeah, okay. I think there's definitely monetary things to it. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, okay. sure. Um, uh, and then here's another one uh, about um, I'm hearing about a new Wall Street vehicle that is as dirty as the junk bond fiasco of 2008. Have you heard of a new looming threat? Um, no, I don't know what that is referring to. Okay. Um, so, so in the interest of being more generative, uh, <laughs> um, could you talk a little bit more about the Public Banking Institute and, and like your successes in that and just maybe give a little bit more background on, on you know, how that came to be and um, so, so that we could just learn more about like this, this movement towards public banking and, you know, the power, the, uh, the influence of your organization to help with that. Oh, sure. Well, <clears throat> um, as I mentioned, I started writing, I started writing about the Bank of North Dakota in right after the Great Recession hit because they were doing so, so well. And um, I was getting so much email that um, I couldn't handle it all. So I complained to a friend and he said, well, why don't you start a Google group? So we did that and they could talk to each other and I wouldn't have to answer them. So we did that. We got all these heavy hitters, like, um, you know, there are money reformers from all over the world. There are social creditors from New Zealand and Australia and the UK. And there was one woman who had worked for the Federal Reserve and, you know, a lot of people that were just, so we learned a lot. We learned how banking works, which is, you know, it took a while to figure, sort all that stuff out. And so finally in 2010, we decided that was when there was the um, Occupy Wall Street, mm. that whole movement. And we decided we, we were now the experts and it was time that we got out and actually, you know, enough talking, we had to get out and organize and do something. So it, immediately we had some amazing, so we, you know, we thought we were on a roll. We immediately got a bill in California for a, well, for a feasibility study, but it, passed both houses of the legislature and then Governor Brown didn't sign it. And we, um, anyway, so, and that's where it was, you know, we had all these bills that would have a lot of, seemed to have a lot of momentum and then they would get stalled in some way. So we had to build up, you know, more expertise, more momentum and, and, Last year in California, we had a bill, AB 857, that was pushed through. We can, Public Banking Institute can't even claim credit, but it was uh, an, a number of cities up and down the coast or up and down California that have, had aligned. I guess we can claim it in the sense that I think we built up those, <laughs> those interest groups in the first place. But anyway, they all coordinated into the California Public Banking Alliance and got this bill passed, AB 857, and with a lot of young people that just have a lot of energy, that those are the people I want to mobilize and harness because they're out there really, you know, it's their, it's their generation coming up and they're the ones that have really gotten the raw deal here and that really need these banks and it needs a need a new system and some hope for re-engineering this system that it's so easy to get discouraged on all the you know the all the things you hear and all the things that are going on but looking on the bright side we are right on the cusp of something and we need to be in there and be
being the agents of change for good for the public, for the people. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, for sure. And no, and it's really, it's, it's, it's inspirational to hear you saying that, like, that young people are stepping up to this. Are, are they in it? Um, so, and I'm just curious about like maybe the blend of what's happening because you're talking about your public banking is something that, that was more prevalent if I heard everything right at one time. And then it, now it's, you know, you've got lonely old North Dakota with, <laughs> um, you know, it's public bank and maybe this is like back to the future kind of thing where, you know, you're advocating for it. Um, there, it sounds like it's it will be of better service to the world, and it's certainly the next generation, like you said, who are going to inherit these issues. Um, how do you see it? And you've mentioned like digital currencies too, but how do you see that paradigm of public banking, which seems a lot more functional and of service, blending with some of these other paradigms of 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 uh, like crypto, whether it's cryptocurrency or other or forms of digital finance, can these play well, together nicely? Yeah, we're definitely coming into di digital currency. I suspect we'll be having national digital currencies. Hmm. I, I don't think you could do it on a blockchain. I mean, from my understanding, it's too expensive, too slow, and too energy intensive. I mean, you just use up all the, <laughs> yeah. but, uh, but there are other, other ways of organizing these things that, uh, I mean, I think it, we must be, digital is surely going to be the currency of the future, but I also think it's very important that we insist on keeping our cash or something that's equivalent to cash because we don't want to be in a system where they, whoever they is, can just turn us off and turn our money off. And I mean, even if it's just accidental, you could imagine all kinds of things that would shut off the power system and shut off your computer. And there you are <laughs> without yeah. any currency. So you've got to have some recourse that you can carry in your pocket. And, and, and maybe that sounds like a system that. Yeah. And as it sounds like maybe if that's where maybe that community currency idea can come in as another, as, as a, not just an alternative, but something that um, enhances the bigger system. Yeah, the community currencies have been popular historically when we have recessions. Yeah. So, you know, it's when the money supply shrinks and it's a way to expand the money supply. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, Ellen, um, anything, any in terms of uh, closing, um, any words of wisdom that you want to leave the audience with as we as we continue with the conference? Uh, I think you, your presentation here is it was a great complement to the earlier presentations um, that we had tonight. So, uh, if you have a chance, please go back and look at those and. We'd love to continue uh, the conversation with you, even if it's online, as the conference continues. Um, I'll read one more question here. What's what's your opinion of the World Bank? Is it tied to the uh, Federal Reserve System slash Bank of England too? Um, the there's the the IMF. I'm actually the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank were both set up in 1944 with the Bretton Woods system. Um, it's the IMF that I'm really particularly suspicious of. Mm -hmm. They they have made well it, the the head of the IMF along with Klaus Schwab has set up this whole great reset system at the World Economic Forum, and the the um, the IMF or the head of the World Bank said that they had. Um, made all these loans due to the, you know, what a tragedy it was, this whole global shutdown, et cetera. But meanwhile, they've made all these new loans. Well, their, their modus, their model is that they have all these strings attached to their loans. So um, they're called conditionalities. And apparently one of the conditionalities was that you had to shut down your economy. And uh, I forget uh, one, 
one small country refused to do that I mean, said that we, you know, our economy is doing all right. We refuse to shut it down. Mm -hmm. So anyway, they, they make the, the country, the government agree to sell off their public assets, et cetera, to pay back these loans. So it's, it's really a tool of enslavement. It's not a good thing, but I think we need some sort of a global system. We need some sort of global exchange system, something maybe like Keynes set up in the first, or planned to set up, but his was not the one that was opted for. We went for the U.S. system instead. But anyway, we need some way of integrating our global system that is fair to everyone and still maintains our democratic just as we want to be individual people, we also want our nationalities. Hmm. Uh, another question that popped up here, and it came up actually in the last presentations earlier, is do you think the world federalists can lead the way to global banking? Sorry, I'm not sure who the world federalists are. Uh, let, me, let me pop Laura in real quick because I'll have her, she can articulate it better than I can. Hey, Ellen. I'm asking um, about the Earth Constitution folks. There's world. Oh, yeah. Okay, no, that's what I'm saying. We need some sort of a global constitution, something that actually preserves individual rights, the you know basic rights like health and food and a, a roof over your head, all that sort of thing that was in Roosevelt's. Um, economic bill of rights. He thought we needed an extra bill of rights. And we could do all that with a money system. I mean, it's easy to see that all we need is the money, but where do we get the money? Um, we can create it. And the, and the, the hangups are against creating it or, well, anyway, everybody knows what that is. Yes, but I agree. We need an, an international system that is democratic, something modeled rather like the U.S. Constitution, but global. Yeah, I mean, they're rebooting at the moment. So the Earth Constitution Institute has a whole new website. And as you know, that's the group that has the most storied history and that peeled off from the U.N. when it was obvious the United Nations is not going to be a democratic body due to the Security Council and other, you know, under the table influences. So, um, yeah, it did come up in the last segment because Adam Stollard has this uh, technology bright ID and he is actually he, he said that he had actually been approached by Glenn Martin and some of the world federalists to talk about not only using the algorithm to protect private identity with regard to cryptocurrency and monetary issues, but even with voting, because they're about to set up world districts, which is pretty exciting. And Glenn, Glenn Martin will be talking about that uh, next week. So for both monetary reasons and voting reasons, um, you know, these two sectors are starting to seriously overlap and inform one another. It's pretty exciting. Yeah, great. Okay. I th you know, there's an observation I want to make, uh, which uh, maybe might come off as, as being a little mystical. But, you know, what I noticed, like when you went through the, the history with the Sumerians like 5,500 years ago is money was when money appeared. And about that same time is like when, when um, uh, the, 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 there was a, a, the imbalance of the masculine and feminine happened and, and societies became more masculine oriented about 5,000 years ago. And now we have, so now there's this, there is definitely a, an appreciation and a respect for the emergence of the divine feminine so I'm wondering, like, and maybe this is a rhetorical question because this could be a whole other program. But how how does how does the emergence of j just uh, not only feminine values, but but concern and care for the earth and good stewardship and all these things? How do you see that um, positively influencing the quote unquote banking system? Well, definitely, if we could get those values in there and if we could get control, I think that's what it would take. I mean, we need some, I can just uh, picture <laughs> a group of, you know, 
women who were love their children and all that stuff, setting up a system that actually works for people in general. And that nothing against men. I think men have done great as well. And, you know, great things historically. But, yeah, yeah no, I, there was. You're right. There was the matriarchal system. Was that was the trans to transfer the handover from the matriarchal to the patriarchal system about them. Yeah. 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 yeah actually, Rianne Eisler believes that it was more about uh, the term that she's using now was partnerism, that it wasn't that we went from matriarchy to pa patriarchy, but that we went from a partnership and egalitarian sort of understanding of roles to then this hierarchical model. And she thinks we're returning to it. Or that is the hope. Her, her keynote speech was lovely on this topic. And yeah, I think, Stephen, you're right. As as humans get more right and brain, right and left brain balanced and, and the sacred feminine reemerges and you know it impacts every sector. That's that's the trickle down deity theory. It impacts every sector. When the God when the Godhead shifts, everything shifts. So exciting times yeah yeah uh, from what i this is you know you want to get into all the weird <laughs> mystical um the difference between us and the next highest life form i mean the things that we were genetically manipulated to do supposedly figure thumb ability to hold tools um left brain right brain of course every animal has a left and a right but our left brain is where we've actually been chipped or programmed to have language which uh, animals don't have. And apparently we actually come into the body with, uh, with language, with the syntax, you know, subject, object, verb, that is something that you may not know the actual language, but you've got the, that thing that you could fit it into of a thing that runs and, or a thing that does something to some, something, that kind of stuff. Anyway, so let's see, the uh, the tongue, the ability to form words, seems to me there was something else, I forgot what now. But anyway, it's all interesting. <laughs> we may be being chipped again, that's the concern. Ooh. Yeah, we've got some futurists coming up in the uh, tech, in the science and technology sector that are gonna probably scare us to death. <laughs> yeah, about the transhuman and posthuman eras. So this has been great, Ellen. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Okay, thank you. Great talking to you. Yeah, we pre and keep yeah, just keep up the good work as we know you will. And just thank you for contributing uh to the conference. I really appreciate it. Yeah, good luck with all your work. Thanks. Thank and you. then uh so we are uh so just to uh tell you what's coming up on the 4th, October 4th, Sector 5, Peace Building and Relations, uh, 5 p.m. Uh, is Paul Chappell, and 7 p.m. Uh, David Sloan Wilson. So we look forward to seeing you all then. Thank you so much. Good night.